Bonjour, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me here to Paris to uh, give a short presentation. Um, I don't speak French myself, so I hope you will bear with me. I will try and speak as, as slowly as I can. Um, apologies if what you see on the screen does not correspond exactly with what I'm going to read out to you, but Mark has kindly put some presentation together for you. Um, I have two pieces of research here. Um, the first one, We're Not Homophobic, is some research which I conducted last year and I put out a report from this earlier on in the summer. And you have a little bit of um, an exclusive because um, this survey I conducted a few months ago, this is the report and it's gone to the media in the UK only a few days ago. So I would like to give you a little exclusive of some of the findings from this as well. So if we concentrate firstly on my research from last year, um, we do not know because of the anonymity of the internet exactly who it is that is conducting homophobia on the internet. Homophobic words are viewed as being soft and forms of seriousness and in abusive levels. We can, however, see that the content of what fans think about LGBTs in the roles they may have as part of our national game, some of which is general or casual soft homophobia, while much of it is quite abusive and vile, and there is an incitement there to hatred. This research was taken from football fans, message boards, from blogs, from websites, from fans' forums, over a 16-week timescale from February <laughs> to May 2010. Of the 4, 400 links, sorry, um, which were filtered to my computer, um, totaling 8,000 threads containing homophobic and homophobia wording, the strap lines and headings then constituted no less than 1,500 of these, which were gay hate um, and anti of an anti-gay abusive nature. We can see that LGBT issues are topical in the news and the amounts of homophobia found on these internet websites then escalates. Um, in particular, the research which I conducted last year, um, this homophobic um, abuse escalated around the time that a DVD was produced, a short DVD by the English FA, and when that was presented and people looked on the internet, the abuse was um, much more than the rest of the days and the rest of the time when this wasn't about. Despite many legislative changes in the UK over the past 10 to 15 years, LGBT people, along with heterosexuals who are perceived to be LGBT, still encounter homophobic abuse or discrimination, whether they are players or whether they are supporters of football. Such abuse is not restricted to the football grounds, but is also in evidence on web-based football fans' websites and blogs. With the internet being so readily accessible to most people these days, there have been, over the last three or four years, along with a, an ever-increasing trend for fans to chant homophobic abuse while attending games, there has been a rise in anti-gay slurs and gay hate from the safety and the anonymity of a computer keyboard. Some players, ex-players and managers are not exempt, sadly, from some of this action either. Football is still perceived to be very much a masculine sport and played by males. Despite recent figures in 2010 stating that over 260,000 women play the game and 1.1 million young girls. And stereotypically, gay men and gay women do not fit. Homophobia is endemic throughout the professional and amateur structures. If we just have a little um, look here, um, 
I'm going to be reading to you from a diagram here. Um, over the 16 weeks the research was conducted, um, 400 links, as I've said before, um, produced 8,000 threads with homophobic content on them, of which 1,500 threads produced gay hate and anti-gay abuse of a vile nature. 5% of this was directly aimed at football players, that's professional football players, themselves from so-called fans of the game. Um, the homophobia, as we've said, escalates whenever there is any homophobia or homophobic content that is issues and highlighted in the news and the media. 48% of the abuse is what we know as general casual or soft homophobia. 10% of the abuse is aimed at British football, British football players from fans globally. I would now like to read to you some of the, some of the content of, um, of this abuse. Um, apologies for some of the, the, the swear words that may be in this content, but I think it, it needs, to be, needs to be seen. Um, on, some of the, on the, some of the fans' websites, there were things saying that homophobia is not a problem in football. Um, around the time of the DVD, um, people were saying, leave the game alone, it's only a bit of fun. You know, homophobia is okay, we're just having banter. So, um, some of the statements were, I can remember the days when, if there was no away fans to fight, it was a regular thing to trash the nearest gay venue when they first started taking over Brighton. Brighton's um, a large community in England. It says, so why does something like, does your boyfriend know you're here? Why is that chant? Why is it offensive to anyone? We have had managers in the past who have stated that we don't have pufters here. I don't particularly like the gays myself, but I will put up with them. Um, you appear to be suggesting that so-called homophobia is a bad thing. Broughton is a town infested with puffs, but everyone is accepting of their behaviour. Why can't we sing? We can see you holding hands. You're all shirt lifters and faggots. People think this is acceptable in England and this can be sung at football games. Um, some other quotes continue. It must be great being gay and, in, and being in the showers. It must be just like being a straight man uh, with access to the women's changing rooms. Others continued. There must be more batty boys that play football that haven't come out yet. There aren't many gays in football. Gays are rubbish at football. What's the problem with homophobia? It's a bit of banter again. And it then escalates to some more damaging and more hurtful things like homosexuality is a disease um, and it's brain damage of some sort. All gays are effing arseholes. I'm not homophobic, but I f if I found out one of my teammates was gay and he had showered with me, I wouldn't be pleased. Um, this escalates again, saying that there's no place anywhere for gays and lesbians in football. Um, these quotes came directly after um, an article was presented where um, an ex-German manager said, there's no place for gays in football. These quotes came about. Um, can you imagine um, a bath with free-flowing AIDS, infected bodies? The only place they are fit for is a camp for a cure, sort of like a, a cure for lepers. It's likely that there are faggots in football. Once footballers were real dudes and they and totally secure in their masculinity. Um, and sadly, one had um, a graphic photograph um, accompanying this last quote where it says, Iran has the right approach to homosexuality and the photograph was two young 15-year-old Iranians who'd recently been hung. So, At the end of a, a recent um, Manchester Derby match in Manchester last year, um, there was a number of, of quotes just because there was a photograph of two, minute, two teammates who were very close um, kissing each other, celebrating the goal. And the... Um, the quotes went things like this. Um, Homosexuality is the devil's work. Kill the gays. Um, 
bags. I would love to, love to knock their effing heads off. Um, gays, it's dirty, it's disgusting, it's sick. Damn queers, we all have to kill all the queers. And gays, again, they are the effing scum of humanity. Stone them all to death. Now, sadly, some of this was on the ESPN website, and um, it was taken down, but it wasn't taken down because of the homophobic content. It was taken down because so many people um, had emailed in and complained that there was a photograph of two male footballers kissing. So to finish with a, a few conclusions here from that particular research, um, something like the internet is very basic and very simple and still very hostile area for LGBTs and those perceived to be LGBT to be abused on. The limitations of the, of the research shows that both race and gender of the perpetrators of the abuse is generally unknown but casual homophobia feeds peer group pressure which can build up to verbal and physical abuse and harassment towards LGBTs. This gives the impression that this behaviour is acceptable. Football needs to try and nip things in the bud through fans groups, through fans forums, through message boards and websites, along with the national governing bodies and other football associations and leagues. Uh, many fans who attend the games are of the understanding that they have not experienced or witnessed any homophobia themselves and it's not really a serious issue. But I think you can, from what the, the, the small clippets of the abuse that I've given you here today, that you know, homophobia and homophobic abuse is quite rife in the UK and in football. Um, I'm just going to skip the, the recommendations because I just want to, to concentrate... Uh, the last couple of minutes now on, on my research that I've just recently put out, um, my report from the survey. The, the survey I put out in the, in the summer, um, I took the first 200 responses. It was a survey, just wanted to get some ideas what was out there from people from sport in general. Um, much of the content is already known to those involved in challenging homophobia in sport, but it was felt that there was a need to concentrate on the evidence and for evidence to be provided for reference. Documented evidence is of vital importance when raising issues and concerns to those involved in sport of a, from the national governing bodies, from the Government Equalities Office, from press and from media and from education establishments, as well as from the grassroots and professionals who identify both as LGBT or non-LGBT. Right. Just over a third, 34%, felt that there was a need, felt they had a need to participate in sport or leisure activities in a safe space by being part of an LGBT or an LGBT-friendly club or group solely. Um, over two thirds uh, stated that they had experienced homophobia in sport. That was out of the 200 that was used for the survey. Only 26% of the respondents of the survey reported any of the homophobia that they witnessed to an appropriate body. Only eight out of those 92 who responded to the question, do you feel satisfied with the responses you got when you reported the homophobia? Like I say, only eight out of the 92 felt that the responses that they got after reporting the homophobia was satisfactory. And lastly, despite the amounts and levels of homophobia in sport, 61% of respondents said that they attended a live sporting event on a regular basis. So we know that anyone who's LGBT loves their sport and loves to attend, and I'm sure there would be much higher figures than that if they want the levels of homophobia around. Um, it was pleasing to see that those who identified both as LGBT and non-LGBT were respondents to the survey. It was also important to have participants take part who were from both grassroots and from professional sport. Um, just very quickly through some of the questions. Um, the first question, that I've, there was quite an even response between um, those who identify as being male and those who identify as being female. Um, which sport or leisure activity do you play? There were um, 25 different sports named by the, uh, the respondents, which is encouraging because then 
we, we can see that LGBTs like to play different sports and not just two or three. Um, which sport or leisure activity do you attend? Again, there was various answers to this. Football was by far the most attended, followed closely by rugby, swimming, cricket and netball. Did the homophobia come from fellow team members, from opposition players, from coaches, from officials, administrators or supporters? Now, the an some of the answers that come back from this were varying again, but it's, it was sad to see that um, most of the homophobic content that came back um, mainly came from supporters, but then the next two were opposition players and even fellow teammates. So those are the top three responses that we had from that question. Um, just to touch then to finish off this research, um, sadly only a few of the answers and the comments which accompanied them were um, of a, a, a positive nature. Some of them which were, were, I've never thought about reporting this before, but the sur this survey has made me think that maybe I should challenge the homophobia. The homophobia was not tolerated after discussions with players and managers. Um, endurance riding is one of the most lesbian-friendly equestrian sports. Loads of us are there just getting on with it. And another one said that they felt satisfied that supporters sorted out any homophobia, which was to be heard while they were playing. Um, if we look at the bad practice and, and the, the negative experiences, some of the quotes were, someone on the team had the nickname Gay Lord, so it was shouted many times during the game. Uh, the follow-up to this was that the head of the school, the secondary school, said it was okay to do this because it was a nickname. <coughs> Another quote was, um, as far as we know, we don't have any LGBT members, although we would be happy to diversify. Another one, um, much verbal bullying uh, goes on in the changing rooms before and after the training and in competitions. The referees are not taking my complaints seriously. And sadly, again, the last one, the threats of violence towards myself and to others from the touch lines um, happens numerous times in football on numerous occasions. So, so just very quickly then to finish, my, one or two of my recommendations. Perhaps more LGBT people need to take more responsibility from themselves if they are safe to, if they, well, if they feel safe to do so, should I say, um, and make a stand and say that enough is enough and challenge the homophobia that's in sport. Um, sport as a whole has to take a zero tolerance approach to homophobia in all its guises. Mainstream sport needs to recognise and promote athletes who are out or, and be supportive of LGBT people and help provide a younger generation with some LGBT role models. Um, information needs to be readily available to LGBTs, which demonstrates that their chosen sport or leisure activity is inclusive of LGBT participation. Um, thank you. If anybody wants me to send any of this research out, I'm happy to do so, so that they can look at it when they have more time. Thank you. Merci. Quelqu'un a des, des questions pour Lindsay? Il y a un micro là. Quelqu'un peut le. Ah, d'accord. Bon. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. Are you working with uh, the football association or any formal structures? Are they? Are they aware of that? Are they supporting your work? Um, unfortunately not, no. Unfortunately, the, um, the English FA, they won't even answer my phone calls or my emails no longer. Um, I was part of their, they have a group, which is called um, a Tackling Homophobia Advisory Group. It was set up and I was invited to be part of this group um, four years ago. We had two meetings. They then disbanded this group and then restructured everything two years ago. And people like myself who are activists and campaigners were not allowed to attend anymore. They, the, the English FA um, invite only people they feel safe and happy and comfortable with because 
I, I present this work and this research, I tell things like it is, and they don't like it because I challenge them, I ask questions, they're questions they don't like to answer, the questions they don't want to answer, and basically the English FA, sadly, despite what you might hear in the press and the media from them, they are not dealing with homophobia. Si je résume en, en deux mots, la question c'était de savoir si la fête nationale anglaise euh, euh, s'intéresse à son travail. Elle a dit qu'il y a quatre ans, il y avait un groupe de travail qui était constitué, euh, qui s'est réuni seulement deux fois avant d'être euh, dissous. Euh, elle y a participé. Depuis les travaux de la fête en matière de lutte contre l'homophobie se font un peu euh, en huis clos et surtout en, en excluant tout, tout militant qui pourrait contester euh, le status quo. Thanks. I'll come talk to you about it later on. I think we have some contacts that maybe might help. Okay, thank you. I had a question. Uh, what the the websites that you you were looking at are they UK based, and what is the legislation in the UK about uh, homophobic speech? Um, I've made um, I've made some inroads with the police and the Home Office in the UK. Because, um, although the websites appear to be UK based, because of um, of how you can go about. Um, getting your domains and things registered, you, you can't always deal with things um, from a UK perspective, so you have to look at it globally. Um, and sadly, both the police and the Home Office, they say because it's the internet, there's nothing they can do. And these are quite high up people in the Metropolitan Police and the Home Office that I speak to, and they feel as frustrated as we do because they're unable to deal with it, they would like to deal with it. So it then becomes down uh, an issue then that needs to be looked at from the UK government. They maybe need to change their legislations and laws. J'ai demandé pour, pour s'il y avait une législation euh, contre ces propos. Elle dit que la police aimerait bien intervenir, mais leur euh, point de vue, c'est que c'est sur Internet. C'est très difficile de, de, de remonter jusqu'à l'origine des, des propos. Euh, et Lindsay propose que c'est à l'État de proposer des mesures euh, plus sévères et pour euh, pouvoir intervenir en cas de, de tels propos. I had in fact two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, I know that uh, in other countries, especially in Germany, there were some uh, LGBT fan clubs that were uh, or groups that were cr recently created just to help and to have an activist attitude to change behavior in the stadium regarding fans' behavior. I was wondering, despite the, the, the absence of response of the uh, British AFA, if there were similar initiatives in, uh, in the UK, that mean uh, the creation of LGBT fan clubs that could help to change behavior in the stadium and make pressure on uh, clubs' owner as well. <laughs> Uh, that's my first question. And the second question that I have is about the, some initiative at the European level. There's some uh, a network that is called uh, Football Against Racism and Homophobia. And in fact, in some countries, we have tried to create some reporting system. That means that you have uh, uh, people in the stadium and looking at bad behavior, bad, bad uh, uh, labeling or things against racism, but also it's beginning now against homophobia. And I, I was wondering if you had uh, some information about this, because it could be complementary to your uh, survey on uh, internet comments, homophobic comments, in fact. This try to, trying to uh, officialize this reporting system. In fact. Yeah, thank you. Um, to take your first question, um, in the UK for 21 years, there has been the GFSN, which is the Gay Football Supporters Network. Um, there's over 500 players and supporters who are members of this group, and they have a committee. But sadly, again, because it is all voluntary work, there's little time to do things. Um, and again, th the committee, because they have been going for so long now, they, again, they know there are issues and they want to do things, but they have hit the same stumbling blocks as myself. 
that it comes down to legislation and getting the associations and the government involvement. Um, there is no fund. Well, th although the fundings are available, the government has plenty of money, despite the e economic downturn, um, and especially with the Olympics coming up in the UK. And football in the UK has millions and millions of pounds, but the Premier League and the Football League do not want to do anything about combating homophobia. So the organisations like the GFSN, who've been going for 21 years, and recently from two years ago, the Justin Campaign, who I work with on the Football v Homophobia projects, they were only given £4,000, that's all, in two years. And that was just to produce the flyers and posters and some of the banners, one which I brought over to Paris Foot Gate earlier this year. Um, but again, they do not want to speak to us, the campaigners and the activists. They, they tell the whole of the country that they are involved and they're in talks with us, but they're not, when it, when it actually comes to the meetings, they don't want us present and they have meetings without us. And basically the Football Association and the leagues they don't know how to deal with it, they're scared to deal with it, but at the same time, we're here and we're ready and willing to work with them and they don't want us to be involved. <coughs> it's, it's easier for them to say, we are doing something when they're not, and it's easier for them to, to say they are doing lots of things when they're not, you know, the money's there, it could be used, we could be doing so much good work, and the good practices that myself and a few other groups do, we we have to pay our own expenses and you know forfeit holidays and things to be able to get our work around to other LGBTs or people who are helping LGBT clubs. Um, and we do not get the recognition or the funding needed, which is really sad because there's a lot of work to do and it needs everyone together. Oui, euh, donc euh, la question c'était de savoir s'il y avait des clubs de super terre et qu'est-ce qu'ils font. Euh, ça existe, il y a un réseau qui a plus de 20 ans, euh, mais ce sont des bénévoles euh, qui se découragent beaucoup parce qu'il n'y a pas de répondants du côté des fédés et de l'État, surtout en matière de finances. Euh, il y a eu un peu de contributions financières, mais, mais très peu, alors que le foot euh, brasse beaucoup d'argent. Euh, en revanche, la, le foot, les assos, enfin les fédés, aiment bien faire croire qu'ils agissent. Mais dans les faits, quand il y a des actions concrètes, les militants sont exclus. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'il y avait d'autre euh, enfin, Je pense que c'est essentiel. Il y avait une deuxième question sur les alertes des stadiums, les reporting des stadiums. Oui, pour répondre à la deuxième question, de nouveau, parce qu'en Europe, il y a une législation différente de ce qui semble être en Europe en Europe as a whole, and it's great to see that so many people in, in Germany and France and Holland and Belgium as fan groups are together in the stadiums and can do protests and banners. Um, unfortunately, we have to ask for permission just to, just to hand out a flyer or maybe some documentation like this. We have to ask permission from the football clubs. They have to ask permission from the football leagues who have to ask permission from the governments and the, the English FA for it to be allowed for us to hand out just a flyer or hand out a poster. Um, and it's not possible because we always get told no. If we try to organize anything in the ground as a fans groups with, with <coughs> flyers or banners, They are taken off of us. Donc, le, la question c'était sur le reporting d'incidents de, de, des stades et la réponse de Lindsay c'est par rapport à, au continent européen où les groupes de supporters sont bien organisés et, et bien, ils ont beaucoup de droits pour agir dans les stades. Euh, en Angleterre c'est différent, euh, il faut demander chaque fois euh, l'autorisation du club pour être présent, pour distribuer des flyers, pour faire de la communication pour agir dans les stades et systématiquement, euh, lorsqu'on demande, il y a des refus. Euh, cela passe par tout le réseau, euh, club, fédé, euh, instances gouvernementales, etc. Donc, euh, ils ont beaucoup de mal à agir dans les stades. Yeah, if we try and, and report things at the games themselves to the clubs or to the FAs, most of the time, we don't even get an acknowledgement. If you do, they say, okay, but we don't think there is a problem. So 
it never gets taken any further. I just have to continue reporting things um, to the FA and to kick it out and to FAIR and to other organisations. The stumbling blocks they have is that although UEFA has done a lot of good work in the last few years to combat homophobia in football, FIFA, uh, and you will probably know from Seth Blatter's comments, those of you who follow football recently, FIFA needs to change its... Um, its code of ethics and also its statutes before things can be done because things need to come from the top and until FIFA um, changes, they can't do it because the legislation is not there for them to be able to change it and sadly FIFA don't want to change those statutes and code of ethics. Donc, euh, lorsque les incidents sont signalés au club, euh, ils écoutent mais ils font rien. Euh, on peut les signaler à la FEDE, euh, ils écoutent, mais ils ne font, euh, font rien. Euh, elle estime que, alors qu'au niveau européen, avec l'UEFA et le programme FAIR, euh, il y a des choses très positives. Euh, C'est un problème qui doit être euh, géré par le haut et on ne peut pas s'attendre à une quelconque initiative de la FIFA telle qu'elle existe actuelle. Euh, c'est à la FIFA de, donner, de mener le, 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 le mouvement et ils ne le font pas. Yeah, we can do as much as we can as campaigners and activists, but the change needs to come from the top as well. People with the power at the very top of football and indeed all sports, they have to make a difference and they have to help. Yeah, we have just a quick final question from Sylvain. C'était pas vraiment une question, c'était un, un commentaire parce qu'il y a déjà des liens qui commencent à se faire avec, euh, qui commencent à se faire avec ce qui a été déjà dit et qui sont, je pense, intéressants. Euh, la première chose, c'est par expérience de recherche, la victimation, les enquêtes de victimation, ce que les gens déclarent sur Internet, de ce qu'ils disent, de ce qu'ils font, euh, est assez pauvre en termes de recherche. Et je pense que le type de dispositif qu'on a là n'est pas très intéressant en termes de recherche et nous donne finalement des choses qu'on qu connaît assez bien, voilà, dont on peut penser mesurer quelque chose, mais en fait qui sont assez acquises en termes de recherche. Par contre, je pense qu'il est intéressant, et ça commence à pointer dans la discussion, en termes d'action, en posant la question de comment on prend en charge. Et je pense que ça rejoint clairement ce que Philippe a posé au début, c'est que ce qui fait la dimension culturelle de l'homophobie, c'est les discours redondants et qui ne sont pas pris en charge. Et n'étant pas pris en charge et n'étant pas discuté, ils deviennent une évidence, un présupposé, quelque chose qui va de soi. Donc quand on répète c'est des PD, c'est des tarlouges, c'est pas bien, etc., et qu'on ne le prend pas en charge, le groupe finit par le répéter et finit par le prendre comme quelque chose qui vient d'évident. Donc je pense que ce qui est très intéressant et qui est sorti là, c'est par contre la, le fait de mettre en place des dispositifs de veille, voire des dispositifs d'alerte et de poser la question « qu'est-ce qu'on fait ?». À ce niveau-là, je pense que la, la question de, de l'arsenal juridique qui permettrait d'intervenir est une manière de traiter cette question-là, mais je pense qu'il y a 100 000 autres manières de prendre en charge ça. Et on voit bien que dans la discussion, euh, c'est ça qui est intéressant. Est-ce qu'on leur donne le livre est -ce qu Mais poser la question de la prise en charge et mettre les acteurs et les persuader qu'il est important de le prendre en charge, parce que sinon ça devient la culture sportive, parce que sinon ça va se répéter et des gens vont le répéter sans le savoir jusqu'à des cadres de fédération, etc. Ça, je pense que c'est un élément très très important de la discussion et là-dessus, je pense que les chercheurs peuvent en tout cas apporter des éléments de démonstration pour expliquer comment se construit la culture homophobe et pas, j'ai envie de dire, plutôt ces, extra ces, ces extractions ou ces expressions un peu superficielles. Deuxième aspect, il me semble je, important. Je, je, peux, can I, je peux, parce que je n'ai pas ouais. de mémoire de, de l'écran. <rire> je, je vieillis. <rire> the, the, his first, he has two questions. The first one is, uh, he observes that uh, studies of victimization, <coughs> this kind, the kind of work you've done, uh, at this point, don't necessarily add a lot because they, the, these are observations that sort of everybody sees and knows, and they're almost part of the culture now of, of, of football or sport. Uh, and so the question is not so much knowing that there's a problem, but what you do, which is what you talked about. And uh, there are different ways of dealing with these actions. Uh, one of them, which is legislation, but there are lots of others. And there's a, uh, a place for researchers, for, for scientists to, uh, <coughs> to suggest the ways in which you can respond to these actions but it takes uh, uh, an initiative from authorities to, to really uh, understand that they are responsible for maintaining this culture. 
Euh, non, non, il n'y avait pas de question. Il y avait un, un deuxième point, je le dis autrement, hein. euh, il faut convaincre les autorités que les campagnes de lutte contre l'homophobie qui consistent à faire un discours et à ne pas prendre en charge ça, ça ne sert à rien et les sociologues peuvent le dire. Voilà, c'est ça qu'il faut faire comprendre. Deuxième aspect, dans la prise en charge législative, il y a quelque chose qui, qui peut être gênant et qui va nous amener à discuter sur ce qu'est l'homophobie. La pénalisation et l'individualisation de la pénalisation, quand on parle de problèmes de culture et de culture sportive, c'est un problème. Parce que ça dédouane l'institution et la culture sportive de faits qui sont attribués ou qualifiés en fonction d'individus. Donc moi je pense que les modes de prise en charge individuels et la pénalisation aussi dure soit-elle, n'est pas le mode d'intervention le plus intéressant. Ils se retournent d'une certaine manière contre ceux qui le promeuvent dans le sens où ils finissent par faire croire que ce n'est pas de la culture sportive mais c'est le fait d'individus qui ont des phobies. Et je pense que là-dessus aussi, il faudra qu'on ait une discussion dans, les, dans, les, dans la journée sur ce qu'on qualifie comme homophobie, puisque je pense qu'il y a quand même une dérive qui s'est mise en place et un espèce de consensus au, autour de, de ce terme d'homophobie qui, je pense, peut être dangereux dans le sens où il pénalise ou il qualifie de plus en plus des individus, des actes individuels, des actes phobiques, euh, dédouanant quelque part l'ensemble des processus sociaux, des, des constructions et des constructions culturelles et institutionnelles qui produisent des attitudes qui, à mon avis, ne relèvent pas de la phobie euh, ou de la perversion, ou euh, d'un quelconque euh, mode de fonctionnement qui serait, on va dire, euh, strictement, relevant strictement de la, de la psychopathologie. Voilà, c'était des commentaires. Donc, en le traitant seulement comme une question légale, une pénalisation des statements statements il y a un risque que vous le traitez comme un problème individuel, un problème de l'homophobe individuel, alors que le vrai problème est la culture du sport, et il doit y avoir une discussion sur the ways in which the institutions recognize that they are responsible for this culture and how do they act. And it's not enough to just say, don't be homophobes. They have to take concrete actions. And, and this is something that needs further discussion. What is, uh, what is homophobia? Is it this, the individual instances that we see or is it more of uh, the culture of sport? <coughs> yeah. No question. <laughs> yeah, if, if I can just add that, you know, I think what we need to do now as activists and campaigners and with people from the government and from authorities in sport, we all need to sit down and have a meeting and work together. We have to educate and re-educate and keep on doing this and keep repeating it. It will not take a short time. It will take a long time to do this, but we have to start and we have to start doing things now. And then eventually, hopefully, mindsets will change and the education will get through. But it has to be done. The, the funding has to come through to amateur sport and to LGBT uh, participation from campaigners and activists uh, so that we can all work together. And we have to push this forward with the education. And if people are not willing to change their mindsets, then ultimately, I think there does have to be <laughs> some sanctions and some legislation but we have to find out now some way where we can all work together. L'essentiel c'est de commencer à travailler ensemble très rapidement euh, avec euh, tous les acteurs euh, sans oublier que la question de l'argent euh, que ça coûte l'argent d'agir euh, que la législation c'est sans doute euh, euh, vraiment un dernier recours et c'est pas le, le meilleur moyen de d'agir contre l'homophobie dans le sport. Thank you everybody for listening.